The sandstone cliffs of Canyon de Chez were home to the Anasazi, a tribe that disappeared nearly 700 years ago. Some of their cliff dwellings remain, however, as do reminders of their fascination with the night sky. The stars on the ceilings of the Anasazi's caves reassured them that there was some grand stabilizing force maintaining their world and its course day after day, night after mysterious night. The Navajo who live on the Arizona land that was once Anasazi also used the heavens' movement and predictability to set their seasons, their times to plant and harvest and hunt. But they had an advantage over modern man. The skies were clearer then, unpolluted. We have long wondered where did we come from? What is our place in the universe? What are we made of? Today we have powerful tools to help us find the answers, but in some ways our civilization has made the answers increasingly difficult to retrieve. The word telescope suggests an optical instrument that gathers visible images of galaxies and stars and planets. But this too is a telescope, a radio telescope an antenna that collects incredibly weak radio signals which cannot be seen but can be manipulated to form images of objects otherwise invisible. Radio frequency signals can penetrate clouds of interstellar dust that block light. These signals can be seen where nothing else can. Radio frequencies are used for many purposes. Astronomers only need to receive radio waves, but most other uses also involve various kinds of transmissions. The result is a radio spectrum of baffling complexity with highly specific windows that are designated for many uses. Astronomers require extremely clear, silent windows throughout the spectrum to detect signals at different frequencies. Unfortunately, the windows designated for astronomy are often adjacent to frequency bands used by an increasing number of space-based satellite communication systems, which radiate powerful signals. Often, these signals spill over into the radio astronomy portions, blocking the extremely weak signals that astronomers are looking for. When you look at the sky, you want to be able to get all of the information that is there we are looking at processes and objects that we can't see with our eyes that we wouldn't know about if we didn't have radio astronomy. At the Five Colleges Radio Astronomy Observatory near Amherst, Massachusetts, astronomer Peter Schlurb and graduate student Amy Lovell are using the radio telescope to observe those classic heavenly phenomena, comets, particularly comet Hale-Bopp. Humankind was once awed, even terrified, by the mere glow of a comet. Today, radio astronomers are able to analyze their molecular composition at wavelengths measured in millimeters. Many objects in the universe are made of molecules, or mostly of molecules. And an example of that is comets. We can see those molecules through their millimeter wave lines in the radio spectrum and that's how we study them and that's crucially important because it's hard to see them any other way. We've made pictures of Comet Hale-Bopp in molecular emission. These are pictures that were made from spectral lines. If some of the frequency access is contaminated with other signals, then we will lose access to the richness of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in the radio band, particularly, we might lose the study of an entire molecule or a group of molecules or crucial organic molecules, for example, that might give us clues to the origins of life. Each spectral line that we observe with our radio telescope has a story to tell us about the object that we're looking at. By looking at one particular spectral line, you can learn about temperatures, but we can also look at other lines to tell us both what the density of the material is and estimate the mass of the object. And finally, we can learn about the chemical processes that go on in the cloud. 
And what we'd like to do is to unravel the history of the cloud and in learning about how stars are made, we learn about how our solar system is made and how we ourselves are made. Frequency pollution is a real threat to what we're doing uh, and it just isn't right. I study a type of star called a pulsar. Some observations of pulsars have been used to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. They're used to study the way stars are born and the way stars die. And when frequency pollution affects our data, the answers to those fundamental questions are simply out of our reach. I don't know what my research will bring, will teach people 100 or 200 years from now. Maybe nothing, but history has shown that there is a tremendous value in allowing some people to ask simple questions like, where are we from, where are we going? Uh, even if there's no immediate practical application. The Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, supported by the National Science Foundation, is the largest, most sensitive single-dish antenna on Earth. This instrument has led to a better understanding of the chemical and physical processes that go on throughout the cosmos. And if intelligent life exists anywhere else in the universe, it is likely to be detected with this telescope. Arecibo can also transmit the strongest signal ever produced by humanity. It bounced the most concentrated radar beam ever transmitted off the planet Mercury. The faint echo that returned to the antenna revealed some unexpected results that frequency pollution would have blocked. What we're looking at here on the screen is a radar image of the North Pole of the planet Mercury. The bright spots are impact craters near the North Pole of the planet that we believe are filled with, with water ice. The floors of these craters are permanently shaded from the sun because Mercury has no seasons. So the crater floors can be very cold, even though the rest of the planet is very hot. Joe Taylor was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of the millisecond pulsar and its implications for the theory of relativity. A pulsar is a neutron star, the collapsed remnant of a supernova explosion. They tend to spin rapidly, and they're strongly magnetized, and therefore they act like very powerful electrical generators. We've learned many things from pulsars. In the first place, they give us a direct probe into things that happen very near the end of the lives of certain high-mass stars. Pulsars act like very precise natural clocks. To have a clock with the signals shining through the interstellar medium gives us a vast array of different experiments we can do probing the interstellar medium, probing the nature of gravitation, probing even the nature of the cosmological history of the universe. There it is. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Oh, wow. This signal that you're watching is, is a pulse from a pulsar. It uh, comes about every two tenths of a second, and it's come through some uh, 300 light years of interstellar space to get here. <laughs> the scientist's job is to try to understand nature's rules. If the experiments we're trying to do are interfered with, then our ability to deduce the rules under which nature is operating are reduced. That would prevent the successful conclusion of an astronomical experiment. There are parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are defined as very exciting by the laws of physics. One of them is close to 1612 megahertz, a small region of the spectrum allocated to radio astronomers for study of the hydroxyl radical combination of hydrogen and oxygen that occurs naturally. But we're not the only people in this part of the spectrum. There are nearby satellite allocations that provide global communications. The real danger is that these nearby transmissions might spill over into the radio astronomy allocation. When looking at a clear, unpolluted hydroxyl radical emission, this is what a radio astronomer sees. If there is even a tiny amount of interference, then the astronomer sees this instead, and unique information is lost. The very large array is located in the desert outside Socorro, New Mexico, and is funded by the National Science Foundation. 
The BLA is a complex of 27 individual radio telescopes mounted on tracks laid out in the shape of a three-pointed star. The tracks allow the antennas to be moved to create different configurations. The information received by the individual dishes can be combined to create a picture as sharp as would be seen by a dish 36 kilometers in diameter. The Very Large Array is a powerful radio telescope. Think of it as a camera taking pictures of the sky and radio waves instead of visible light. Part of its power and flexibility comes from the fact that we can move these antennas around and simulate the action of a zoom lens. The VLA is used to look at the sun, stars and planets, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, other galaxies, and all the way back to the edge of the universe, the Big Bang, where it all began. This is an image of the galaxy NGC 4261, taken by an optical telescope. This is the same galaxy as seen by the VLA, revealing details invisible to optics, gas jets, charged particles, and possibly even the presence of a black hole. One of the great things about radio astronomy is that you can study things that you simply couldn't study on Earth processes that are just too energetic to simulate on Earth, or you can look at molecules that are very difficult to produce in a chem lab on Earth, or keep around in a chem lab on Earth long enough to study. Astronomy is a grand science. It deals with enormous things. It deals with big numbers. It deals with enormous distances. It's all mind-bending stuff. I love it. Radio spillover, or the general pollution of the bands that we need to do this research, I think is very much like being stuck in a house with frosted windows. You can't see out. If we or any future generation wants to understand the environment that they live in, or the evolution of the universe, or the origin and fate of the universe, we're going to have a hard time answering these questions, let alone asking them, if we have no access to the universe. Radio telescopes work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, gathering information that cannot be obtained by any other means. The only thing that can block them is radio frequency pollution. The electromagnetic spectrum is an incredibly valuable shared resource. I have no problem with that. But what's crucial is that the small, narrow segments allocated to radio astronomy be kept open now and for future generations, so that the kind of research that we're doing can continue to be carried on. Don't close the window. Some of the most vigorous and fundamental processes in the universe can only be observed at radio frequencies. And if we don't protect radio astronomy's unique abilities, we erase a vast area of potential knowledge. Today, we can detect signals and see things that primitive man never dreamed existed. But mysteries remain, waiting for radio astronomers to explore.